Let's talk about monsters. Sometimes when the moment strikes and you feel just a hint of wrongness, you feel the need to shut your eyes as tight as humanly possible. On a subconscious level, you are being very, very smart. Or if you were to open them, you would find yourself face to face with a creature that wants your eyes. Now, what would they want to do with your eyes, you might ask? The answer, my friend, is simple. To spy. I'm sure you've seen it. Those people who stare out blankly as if off in their own world. Who isn't to say that as they slip out of reality, something else decides to take a look. That something else decides to know. So that perhaps, maybe, if they collect enough information, they might one day become. They say to keep your eyes peeled, but maybe keep them shut. Let's talk about monsters. You, my friend, have fallen down a well. I think you'd find it strange that you've yet to hit the bottom. The brick around you gives way to the vast darkness of an empty cavern. Your scream echoes in the shadows as you are finally caught by silk. You notice it's sticky when you try to pry your hand off to grab your phone. A tack, 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 tack can be heard skittering along the edges of the walls. Your phone blinds you more than the darkness ever did. Hastily, you move the screen away from you. The eight giant legs surrounding you are the first thing you see. The second thing after the abdomen is the humanoid-esque body attached to it complete with a scarred up sculpted face, two mandibles, and four blind eyes. I hope you're not afraid of spiders. Let's talk about monsters. As an astronomer, you first notice its presence when a star implodes too quickly on itself far, far away. From your high-powered telescope, you watch as dark matter bends the light of all the stars around it, like a fisheye lens. One by one, they fizzle out. At first, you think it's a fly, then a smudge, then a prank, because there is no way that stars blink out like this. But climbing a ladder to make sure there's no prank requires you to look up to a horrifying sight. For a pinpoint star you know is so far away to create a black dime that only grows in the sky. Well, that is not something any human mind is meant to contend with. Strange to think that no human in any city would recognize the growing calamity, but in the wilderness, you see it all too clear. It smiles. Let's talk about monsters. Every person you've ever known has come across it once. A smudged shape at the edge of a photograph, in the reflected light of a lover's eyes, in the closet you face during sleep paralysis. If you're unlucky and face it head on, it has two big eyes with pins for pupils, hung low on a grin of too many teeth, wider and wider as if the smile never ends. All instinct, no thought. I could tell you it doesn't bite, but we'd all know I'd be lying. The marks don't always show, but the pain certainly does. And if you don't remember, you are lucky. Let's talk about monsters. I would say you know this moment better than most. It's the moment when people run away. Your many eyes flash in concern as they trip over themselves, knowing that this was what they wanted. They'd asked you over and over again, and you just thought to yourself, maybe, maybe this time would be different. Maybe you could be understood for once. I mean, the whole world doesn't have to go to hell in a handbasket if your world is already hell. But they scream, they scream, they just keep screaming. You walk your transformation back just enough to speak, to try and reassure them that everything's okay, but it's already too late. You know you'll never get them back. Let's talk about monsters. You write a romance horror novel about Jeff the Killer. And somehow it becomes a best-selling hit. And somehow, in this real universe, there's a real Jeff the Killer out there somewhere, and he reads your book. And he likes your book. To the point where he's like, yes, I want this in my life. I want this romance. <laughs> 
So they come knocking at your door and you're like, mm, mm, no, this is not what I signed up for. Well, he's like, hey, it's cool, it's cool. This was like a self-insert thing, you know, you, you and me, you and me, together, ah, huh? and somehow he's sweet and he ends up courting you in real life. Why can't I have normal dreams? <laughs> Let's talk about monsters. There's a televangelist you can hear sometimes flickering between the legitimate stations of AM radio. When he's on, your mood shifts and it's hard to turn the channel. My brothers and sisters, he calls out, and it almost feels like it's directed exactly at you. Take this sweet time out of your busy lives and listen only to me. And though you're not religious, you do. The voice is melodic, but somehow strangely sinister as it bubbles into you. Half the time, you don't even know what he's saying. The languages keep changing, and, well, sometimes it's just guttural rasps. You're lucky you're driving a lonely stretch of highway because it is taking everything in your power just to watch the road. But when the static straightens out again, so do you. And it's only now you wonder what this thing has taken from your soul. Let's talk about monsters. You're picking apples in the orchard when you come across a large black snake slithering betwixt the branches. You ask it what it's doing here and by golly gee, it responds. Saying, if you can believe it, I actually own this orchard. You say, but you're a snake. And he says, I wasn't always. A long time ago, my prized apple was plucked from me, filled to the brim of all knowledge and magic of this universe. And with every bite, my body became something else. Magic in my body scattered within you breed, leaving me not but a black noodle with a voice box. Limbs would help. Seeing a fresh opportunity, you put your application in on the spot. Let's talk about monsters. Out in the wilderness, as you're being sapped dry by mosquitoes, you may come in contact with a man. You'll recognize them by their wide-brimmed hat and veil that falls all the way past their feet. Through an opening, they'll beckon you with gloved fingers. And if you follow him through the boggy landscape, he'll treat you to a sight that most don't see. Sometimes it's to a particularly beautiful field of psilocybin. Sometimes it's to a forgotten cellar filled with human teeth. But on very rare occasions, he'll take you to a dock in the bog housing a wood canoe. If you know anyone who's dead and he gets in first, go in after him, but do be silent all the way. At the other end of the bog, the mosquitoes making up his net will blow away, revealing your long-lost loved one. Let's talk about monsters. The ding-a-ling-ding -ding of an ice cream truck is just what your neighborhood needs. Children nearby scream with excitement as they rush out to meet it. And for nostalgia's sake, you decide to get something too. A deformed SpongeBob SquarePants pop, perhaps? Or maybe the Klondike in red, white, and blue? But by the time that you get there, the screams of laughter have silenced and there's not a child in sight. You get to the ordering window of the van and there is an ice cream cone mascot silently staring at you with dead eyes. The whole thing screams the 1950s. A little out of place in time, but you don't mind as he points to the menu and then at you. You wonder if it's a gimmick that all the menu items are spelt wrong. You order the emo tears sonic face and go to grab your cash when the swirly cone mascot raises a gloved hand as in saying, no, this is on him. He's got this. You say thank you and go to grab your weird, weird treat and its hand securely clasps itself to yours and begins to melt. The ice cream man's ice cream hands begins to ooze over your arm and shoulder and tugging, pulling you into the machine. Now, I'm not a betting man, but I do think this might be what happened to those kids. I scream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream. Let's talk about monsters. Being of science such as yourself finds it hard to hypothesize what could possibly be behind the crystalline chrysalis standing before you now. 
You had originally mistaken it for one of the amethysts found in this jewel-encrusted cavern when it starts to move. It is far larger than any insect you've ever known or seen, standing at a staggering five feet. As your team goes to collect more samples, you all realize there are more of them. All of them much smaller though, but still larger than an insect. <laughs> Some the size of cats, and all of them with different shimmers and shines. The stream underground babbles as you bring one up to your ear and listen, a harmony appearing. Like a glass water bell, it sings. As a soft breeze makes its way to the inside, the rest hum at different pitches. The one you hold cracks, and you watch as it unfurls a fairy. And you wonder, nay, hope that the ones that are large are not nefarious. Let's talk about monsters. So your timeline's ending. How unfortunate for you. But ah, there may be hope yet. You just so happen to be on the planet where the two guardians of fate reside. The end and the beginning, respectively. The beginning slides by the waterfall, a slug-like flower of flesh and insect wings, while the end hovers silently, a marble sphere along the backdrop of mountainside. You climb to the top to meet in the middle and plead your case for the universe, the grand apocalypse slowly eating away at the edges of time. They state in words that you can understand that they are the wolves that you feed, the fate of the universe residing in the choices made by each individual within. Up to this point, they've been very balanced, so it's up to you to make the final call. If you had the chance to rewind the clock back in time, what would you have begin? Let's talk about monsters. Your graduation goes smoothly. Your Aunt May couldn't be more proud, but you start to feel cramps right in your legs. Earlier, you had had to swat a spider away after catching the sting of its bite. Feeling a little woozy, but not thinking much about it, you went along with your day. Now your graduation gown begins to writhe, but you're too choked from the pain to speak. You try to run off the stage as best as you can, those limbs of yours splitting apart underneath you. And you think to yourself, it's just nerves or bad food. Humans can't do this, it's just nerves. But when you calm down in the field nearby and the pain subsides, you look underneath you. Your lower half is a mass of spindly blue limbs. You manage to find a way to coordinate them so it looks like you're walking bipedally, but there is no use in denying that you have now become a Spider-Man. Let's talk about monsters. They meet you in the hallway and ask if you'd be willing to go to their favorite restaurant with them, and you accept. It's a bit of a drive, but they say it's worth it, and you end up in a part of town you've never been to before. Fairy lights and lanterns zigzag themselves across the streets, and it feels unfamiliar but warm all the same. You roll your window down for the sake of the summer heat, when it catches your eye that everyone walking by is wearing masquerade masks. You wonder if you've missed a holiday today, or if it's a festival of some kind, now feeling woefully underdressed. But your date greets you with a smile as you step out of the car and hands you a mask of your own. When you ask why, they hush you and say that you have to keep it on no matter what you do. When you go to press further, they say rather cryptically, We came here to eat, not to be eaten. Let's talk about monsters. Go cast yourself a wish in the wishing well. But do it at the break of dawn, just when the sun is creeping up over the horizon. That's when the wishing spirits come to break the blessings off the coins. And they do love a fresh wish. If you manage to make it in time, thank the well first. They'll notice. And if you so happen to see one shimmering like mist and fog, tell it not that it is beautiful, but that it is wise, for they do not care of frivolity. And do wish it good fortune. As shepherds of good luck and well wishes, to see one care for theirs will bring compassion to yours. They'll collect the wishes as petals and sew them into their flowing dresses, only to fly off with them trailing behind in a glittering wave of silver linings in the sun. Make a wish. Let's talk about monsters. The wild ones wander near. You wish that you were one of them. They wish that you were here. Willfully they wait for you walking, wailing in the woods, whistling wordlessly, harnessing their howls, weaving their wavelengths, crossing bone after bone after bone. 
Your eyes grow heavy, and cradled in the darkness, in the center of their madness, layeth you, dear reader. There is a vulnerability in the likes of being known, under the rays of moonlight to have your cover blown. They peel away your layers, like an onion or a cake, while you're hoping to your deities that it's not a big mistake. The wild ones watch you, watching them watch you whittle your worries slowly away. And when it's finally over, you know you're here to stay. Welcome home. Let's talk about monsters. Some would say you're lucky that the moon covets you, but you know better. The tides dip towards you, much to nobody's surprise. A bend of foamy pearls curl and unfurl as they lap at the sides of your thighs. And you know if you're not careful, you'll get dragged into the sea. Just so those sweet silver slivers cascading from the heavens can sate themselves on your skin. The moon is cheeky and sly, you see, and it knows what it can get away with. Many would find it romantic, but you just find it pushy. They should really know better by now. After all, you're already very tied down to this earth. You're reminded by gravity on the daily. And even if the moon drew near, there is one thing that is clear. No matter which way you choose, up or down, you'll always lose. Whether skies fall or oceans rise, if you return their love, everyone dies. The moon still asks you to hold your breath. And you tell them not to hold theirs. Let's talk about monsters. You haven't existed in a very long time. The chain link fence that you climbed out of reach has yet to be climbed since. Rumors and queries of where you might have gone have long since subsided, and the dust settles in your U-shaped space. Though there were witnesses of your departure, hints at your folly, no one came. No one ever found you, and most did not even bother to look. Now, the roots plunder you, and you let them happily. Tendrils taking shape around where your heart used to be. And now this strange tree grows taller by the day. Higher and higher until even that chain link fence can't hold them away from seeing you. Seeing you stand tall without them. Not existing in their lives. You think it's better this way. Let's talk about monsters. The amount of antlers strung up, tied down, and made into furniture makes you uneasy. When your friend said they were into hunting, you didn't think this much. Their house is a taxidermy museum. Elk, bison, deer, moose, even things that shouldn't be there at all. You wonder about legality, but don't say a word. The hunter laughs at you as you stare into the glass beady eyes of a taxidermied fox going so wrong. And they tease that they think that you would make good game reminiscing of the way you used to sprint at your local high school track team. You slowly turn back to them, wishing that this cottage was closer to the human population than what it is, and they laugh at you again. And since you're not taking the hint, they take their shotgun off the wall, cock it, point it at you, and tell you to run. They say they won't shoot, but I wouldn't trust them. Let's talk about monsters. There's a squeaking of bronze joints as the bookkeeper leans in to listen to you patiently. Their eyes are aglow like two stoplights, reminding you why you're here. You spin your tale of woe to the jury, and it memorizes your cadences in typewriter tic-tacs and click-clacks. Thinking to yourself, you find it a bit surprising that it's still here, considering there's been a new model that's been out for quite some time now. But public funding isn't quite what it used to be, and honestly, you find it quite soothing. When recess is called, it dings and whirs, eyes blinking from a red to a light green. In a flash of curious inspiration, you go up to them as they pack their papers inside of themselves and ask if they want to have coffee or oil or whatever it is that they have. They chuckle in radio fuzz and say, sure, why not? A little bit of steam creasing out the edges of their mechanical mind. You can't help but think maybe you should do crime more often. <laughs> Let's talk about monsters. So you're going grocery shopping with a ghoul. It's okay, it's Halloween, everyone's dressed up, no one's gonna notice. 
past the vegetables and go straight to the meat section because, of course, on their way there, they bump into a Frankenstein's monster. The ghoul goes, <laughs> Frankenstein's monster goes, <laughs> And it turns out they're on the same wavelength. They they get the language. It's understandable. They 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 actually met the real freaking Frankenstein's monster. And it's a meat cute in the meat section of a freaking grocery store on Halloween. <laughs> Later, years from now, when the ghoul proposes, the Frankenstein gives them their hand in marriage. But in the meantime, they're just ghoul friends. <laughs> the meat cute. Happy Halloween. Yeah. <laughs>